So two big questions that we ask a lot, I think, can be resolved tonight, and if they are, then it's going to save you a lot of time and energy over the course of your life. There was a photo from one of the events that we did at the Georgia Dome, not the most recent one last year, but the first full dome event that we did several years ago. And the photograph was from the, the back row of the top section. So in this arena, it would be as if it were up there to the very, very top upper deck last row. It's a fisheye lens shot so that it kind of wrapped around and you could see the entire stadium filled with you. And that picture was tweeted. I don't think uh, Instagram really had a lot of traction yet at the time. And I remember that it was John Piper who made the comment, arrows in the hands of God. And that statement just riveted me to think that this is the reality tonight, that you and I can see ourselves as flaming arrows in the hands of a merciful God. And to think about the possibility of what would happen if, I don't know, there's 30 plus thousand of us in buildings and tens of thousands of us around the world right now linking in, what would happen if the 40, 50 plus thousand of us said yes to being flaming arrows in the hands of a merciful God tonight? Where would he send us and what would happen in the world in the generation to come as a result of that? So the questions are these, the two big questions tonight. Number one, what is my purpose? Is anybody asking that question? Like, like what is my calling? I don't know how you would phrase it. What, what is it that I'm supposed to do with my life? I think when you're coming through this window of time, 18 years of, old, 18 years of age, 20, 22, 25, 30, uh, still some people asking, what is it I'm supposed to do? I know there are a lot of options and I know there are a lot of paths, but I want to know what I'm supposed to do. What is my purpose in being on the planet right now? And I think the second question is maybe the, the, the more difficult question, and it is this. Can I get past my past? And I love that Christine took that head on today in such a phenomenal and powerful way. Thank you, Christine, for, for just leading us down that road of saying goodbye to a life that is marked by, dominated by, controlled by shame. The, the first question is, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Why am I on earth? And can I ever really figure that out and get on that track? The second question is, can I get past my past? Can I get past the fact that my family cracked in two or in three or in some of your cases in four? And I'm confused by a lot of things, been disappointed by a lot of things. I have a lot of regrets about things I've done and things that have been done around me and things done to me. I've got wounds in my life. Can I get past the shame? Can I get past the guilt? Can I get past the letdown and the disappointment? And can I find the power to actually live on purpose for a purpose? This is the greatest treasure on this earth, is to wake up every single day and go, I know that I am living my life on purpose. I'm not incidental, I'm not accidental, and I'm not just going with the flow, but I know my life has a reason, and I'm not waiting till I graduate from school or I find the right person or I get that first real job or I get out on my own. I'm not waiting to some other season to get into that mindset. I want to know I can wake up tomorrow and start living a life on purpose for a purpose. So maybe no one here is asking either one of those two questions, but if you are, I think we can resolve both of those questions right here and right now. Does that sound a little too simplistic? Maybe it is a, a little simplistic sounding, but I believe the answers to both those questions are found in God's Word, specifically in the second chapter of Acts, and that's where I want to direct us tonight. 
And I want to focus this on two phrases. The first phrase is this, the finished work of Christ. Can you say that with me? The finished work of Christ. Let's say it with me, all, all the venues together. The finished work of Christ. Second phrase, the unfinished work of the church. Can you say that with me? The unfinished work of the church. So two big ideas in Acts chapter 2, the finished work of Christ and the unfinished work of the church. And if you know your scripture very well, you're like, no, those are not the big ideas in Acts chapter 2. The big idea in Acts chapter 2 is that it was Pentecost and the promise of Christ from the Father arrived on planet earth and the Holy Spirit came down and changed the lives of people. That's the story of Acts chapter 2. Well, that's very much in Acts chapter 2, but I think what we'll see as we do a flyover of the chapter tonight is that it really is focusing, focusing us on the finished work of Christ and the unfinished work of the church, and that's where the Holy Spirit comes in to your life and to my life. So to the second question, can I get past the past, we take statement number one, the finished work of Christ, and I want to direct you to Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Peter is preaching, and he says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He continues, this man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him, Jesus, to death by nailing him to the cross. Verse 24, but God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then if you fast forward to verse 36, therefore, let, it, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, this, this sermon, by the way, has got a little bit of a point to it because he's talking to the people who actually participated in the death of Jesus. And so he, he's stepping on a lot of toes in this. He says, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. The reality of this gathering is that Jesus Christ came by God's purpose, by God's foreknowledge, by God's design into humanity through a virgin birth to live a perfect life, God in the flesh, so that he could take on that shame. He could take on the guilt and he could take on all the condemnation for your sin and my sin. Then he could be under the wrath of God that all of our sin deserved, obliterated by the wrath of God in death on a cross, yet to be raised up from death, from hell, from the darkness, from the grave, from all the power of hell, by the power of Almighty God, so that He could raise us up with Him into brand new life. You can put the past behind you. But you can't put the past behind you by resolving to put the past behind you. You can't put the past behind you by talking yourself into the fact that you're going to put the past behind you. You can only put the past behind you by locking your gaze on the finished work of Jesus Christ who hung for six hours on that cross taking the guilt, taking the shame, taking the wrath, taking the sin, and taking the blows. And at the end of it all, he said, it is finished. It's finished. What's finished? All the payment that we owed is finished. 
All of us trying in our best effort to make peace with God, that's over. Religion is done. There is now no more attempt in the flesh to measure up to a holy God because holy God has come in the flesh to measure us up by His righteousness and by His stripes we are healed. This is the finished work of Christ. I know it's not new news. I don't see anyone writing this down. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ took on our guilt and shame but this is what was spoken in Isaiah chapter 6, that moment where that seraph came flying from the altar of God with a coal of fire and tongs from the altar of God. He's coming to Isaiah who knows he's a sinful man because he's seen the holiness of God. And the seraph comes and he touches his lips with the coal and he says, see this coal has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin is atoned for. Now that doesn't mean that there's going to be a seraph fly down out of heaven tonight and touch your lips with a coal from the altar of God. What it meant was 700 years before Jesus, the prophecy is laying the groundwork for Jesus that the living coal coming from heaven is not some ember from the altar, but it's actually a member of the Trinity. It's God Himself, Jesus Christ, coming down out of heaven. And it's His righteous, blazing sacrifice that touches our lives. And two things happen. Our guilt is taken away. If you're carrying guilt, if I can just be honest, that's your fault. Oh, I just, I can't get over my past. That's simply a reflection of the fact that we don't have our eyes on the cross of Jesus Christ. We're looking at our problem. We're looking at our failure. We're looking at our regret. We're looking back at shame. We're looking back at the guilt. We're looking at us. But when you get your eyes off of you, I get my eyes off of me, which is a miracle, by the way. When we get our eyes up on to the cross of Jesus Christ, we see written there, it is finished. There is no more guilt for you to carry. He carried it all. And it does not honor Jesus for me to carry the weight of the guilt that crucified him and caused him to suffer and die. What honors Jesus is for me to look at the cross and go, I agree with you. I agree with you. I am forgiven. I agree with you. I have been made new. I agree with you. My guilt is gone. My shame is removed. My sin is atoned for. I agree with God. I'm not any longer agreeing with me. I'm not good enough or I didn't measure up or whatever Jesus did for everybody else didn't count for me. I'm telling you, when Jesus went to the cross, one drop of his blood was enough to cleanse all of humanity and you are in that story. So if you want to move past your past, and you can. If your question is, can I move past the past and find the power to actually live on purpose? The answer is yes. And that answer is found and rooted in the finished work of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it a different way. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's who we are. And once our minds are opened, our eyes are open to agree with God and to say the two most powerful things we can say, God, I believe it. Hello? Anybody? I believe it. And secondly, I receive it. In that moment, the reality of that statement, by his wounds, we were healed, becomes an operational reality inside our heart. And we begin to move forward in the purposes of God. I, I will never, ever get over the cross of Jesus Christ. I don't want to. I don't want to move on from it because all of my life is found in it. I want to cherish it. I want to kneel before it. I want to celebrate it. I want to pick it up and carry it. I don't need another gospel because the one I've got is the best story ever heard. It is death to life in Jesus Christ. And I hope that you know that story. 
I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of this message tonight to say yes to the gift of Jesus Christ, to take away guilt, and to atone for all the sin of your life. But to do that, you have to understand the basic heart of the gospel, and it is this, that sin doesn't just make you bad. See, that's the world around us. Oh, you're one of those Christians. You're, you're better than everyone else. Man, if I hear that one more time, I think I'm going to literally, literally not figuratively throw up. If somebody one more time tells me, oh, you're one of those Christians, y'all are better than everybody else. It's like, no, here's the reality. I think a true follower of Jesus certainly doesn't think he's better than everybody else, but it probably has a way better grip on the fact that he is not better than everybody else. Because a true follower of Jesus is not walking through life going, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing all right. I think I'm fine. I don't think I need anybody. A true follower of Jesus saying, man, I saw the holiness of God, and then I saw me, and when I saw me in light of the holiness of God, I knew I was undone and that my chances were very slim. In fact, they were none. That's what a true follower of Jesus believes. He's not looking at his neighbor going, man, you got problems. He's looking at his neighbor going, I get it. I get it. We all have got some major problems stuff as a result of our choices in sin but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus I hope I never get over that gospel message that sin doesn't just make you bad that's what the world thinks well I'm doing pretty good it's like well great how's that measuring up to a God who hears holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty every second of every day, every year of all the ages, eternity past, present, and future. How does I'm doing pretty good stack up to that? It doesn't stack up to that. And if, if you wondered why when John Piper started today, he said, None of us deserves to be here. That is exactly the reality. So this whole thing of, well, I didn't get what I deserved. No, thank God we didn't get what we deserved. <laughs> we got mercy. And on top of mercy, we actually got more than that. We got grace. So the gospel isn't that sin makes you bad. Hello, the gospel is that sin makes you dead. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin isn't that you're bad. The wages of sin is spiritual death. But check this out. The verse goes on. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the gospel, you understand, it's not about being bad or good. The gospel is about being dead or alive. Can you move past the past? I believe you can, but to move past the past, you have to celebrate, cherish, believe, and champion the finished work of Christ. The enemy is always going to come to you and tell you what you need to add to the work of Christ. And you need to be able to communicate clearly to yourself in that moment, Jesus paid it all. And there is not one more thing I can add to be completely forgiven and to have peace with God. The second question, which was the first question, how can I find my purpose in life, I believe is answered by the second statement. So I know that's a little confusing because we had two questions and two statements and then we flip-flopped them a little bit. But the first question, how can I find purpose in life and know what I'm supposed to do, is answered by the second statement and that is the unfinished work of the church. So we talked about the finished work of Christ. That's all done, settled, forever. But there's still an unfinished work of the church. Are you on board with the fact that the church has unfinished business? Now I know the work word's not a real popular word. I think that the church has unfinished work. But the church exists for a reason. And the reason the church exists is a mission, and that mission is at the heart of God tonight. And if you want to know what God's thinking about, He is thinking about you. He does see you and know you. He is El Roy, the God who sees, and He sees you. But if you want to know what God's thinking about right now, God's thinking about the central mission 
for which the Spirit came and the church was born. And do you know what that mission is? It's that every single person on planet Earth will hear about the finished work of Christ. The unfinished work of the church is to make sure every person on planet Earth gets to hear about the finished work of Christ. And until every person on planet Earth hears about the finished work of Christ, the church's work is still undone. And you see this in a flyover of Acts chapter 2. I got mine laminated. Yeah, that's so I can take it in the shower with me. If that sounds weird, you're not memorizing big chunks of scripture. <clears throat> it's a lot of good shower time. You can knock some verses out, but you gotta, you gotta laminate. That means going to Kinko's and, you know, doing the old school stuff. Let's do a quick flyover of Acts 2. What, what do you know about it? Well, obviously, it opens with the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Can we just say amen to that? It says, and as they were gathered together in one place, suddenly a sound like a mighty rushing wind filled the place where they were gathered. And not too long after that, they saw what seemed like tongues of fire coming down out of heaven and separating and resting on them. And then immediately they began, this band of about 120 Jesus followers, who for all purposes were a little bit unsure, a little bit nervous, somewhat afraid, holed up together, not knowing which direction to move in because of all of the turbulence of the crucifixion of Jesus. So here we are 50 days later, and the Spirit of God that Jesus told them he was going to send arrives in such a powerful, demonstrative way, nobody is mistaken that this is what Jesus talked about. The result was that all of them, when the tongues of fire rested on them, they began to all speak in different languages. Can you imagine that moment happening? And you say, well, well, why would they all start speaking in different languages if there were 120 of them in there, and maybe they didn't even know different languages, so they wouldn't even know what languages they were speaking in. That seems weird that they would all start speaking in different languages in a room together, all kind of huddled together, all knew each other well. What, what was that about? What that was about was, in this case, that this was another festival season. And Jews from all over the known world had come back to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And so in the city was four times the normal population and people from every area of the known world at that time. And so now these Jesus followers, touched by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, are all talking in different languages, miraculously, supernaturally, and they're making such a roar with their languages, there was such a shaking with the sound of the mighty wind that people rushed to the scene to see what was going on, and as they did, here came the 120 people all speaking in different languages. And this is what it says. This is pretty amazing. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Verse 5. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? And then Luke records kind of what went down. He said there's Parthians and Medes and Eliamites. They're people from Mesopotamia and from Judea and Cappadocia, people from Pontus and Asia, people from Phrygia and Pamphylia, people from Egypt and 
the regions of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and this is what they said at the end of it. They said, we all hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Come on. The Holy Spirit arrived and in 15 minutes, 15 nations were hearing the wonders of God in their own languages. You're not quite as excited about that as, as Luke was, I don't think. So the flyover is this. The Holy Spirit arrives. Tongues of fire set tongues on fire. And the wonders of God are being declared. Not on a micro, but on a macro. Not just huddled around a campfire so we can all sing Kumbaya one more time. And talk about how good God is again. But so that the whole world can know that Jesus is alive. Check out this diagram of those places that a lot of which we've not heard about. The Parthians, Medes, the Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Judea. These are those places. And you can see Jerusalem in the center. One arrow coming from Rome, the center of the world at that time. The emperor called himself God. All across the Middle East, the most contentious area of the world probably down into Saudi Arabia, into Africa, all across the Mediterranean, Central Asia, all across Greece, Christine, all of a sudden, are you, are you seeing this? In one moment, the purpose and plan of God was being unfolded. So what happened next? Well, uh, a lot of people didn't get it. So they said, man, these people are, had a little too much to drink. And then someone answered and said, no, it's, it's early in the morning, man. These, these people are not drinking. This is, this is the promise of Joel 2. And in the last times, the sons and daughters are going to prophesy when God's going to pour out his spirit on mankind. This is what this is, Peter said. And then Peter, second thing that happens, first thing, Holy Spirit comes. Second thing, Peter preaches the gospel. We just read it, a little part of it. Third thing that happens the church is born. On that day when Peter preached and said that if people all over the world repent, they can be saved. People repented from all over the world right then. And the text says, I love it, 3,000 people were added to their number that day. Now listen, don't, I'm not trying to make a big point out of this, but don't let anybody set you off by uh, dogging the megachurch. God doesn't believe in big churches. The gospel cannot be contained. And it's nature. The nature of the gospel is to explode in the hearts of people. The nature of the gospel is revival. The nature of the gospel is awakening. The nature of the gospel is people getting saved. Not one a year or two a year, but lots of people coming from death to life. That's the result of the power of the gospel. And that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it, because it's the power of God to salvation. And 120 people went to 3,120 people in one day. Now, now don't, don't fret over that because the last part of the chapter, which we love, says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone that had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
So what we see in the flyover of Acts chapter 2 is this. When the Holy Spirit arrives, people's lives are transformed, and they're transformed to proclaim the gospel in power. Peter, all of a sudden, is preaching to this huge crowd of people with all this unction on his life as a result of the Spirit of God. And as he's preaching in the power of the Spirit, 3,000 people get saved, the church is born, the church is huge right off the bat, but that doesn't stop them from meeting together, caring for each other, breaking bread to, together, and following the, the apostles' teaching. So, hello, it's not an either or, A or B, small home group, community church, or is it this big thing that God is doing? Hey, it's both of those things. The church is explosive, and people should be getting saved every single day. I want you to leave here with a vision that on your campus, somebody can get saved this spring every single day. Not four people, not 13 people, but every single day. We're at South Dakota State University, Louis. We don't have all that stuff you all have down in the south. Well, you have the gospel, and as far as I know, it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, even people who live in parts of America that aren't in the quasi-Bible belt. And it's probably easier to proclaim that gospel in the non-Bible belt parts of the world than it actually is in the Bible belt parts of the world where everybody goes, I've heard that a thousand times. And so in the flyover, what do we see? We see the mission of God. Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Boom, done. Acts 1, 4, but wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes and you receive power. And then you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what does God care about? He cares about the peoples of the earth. And how do we know that? Because on the day the Holy Spirit came, Jerusalem got the gospel, Judea got the gospel, Samaria got the gospel, and the ends of the earth got the gospel on day one. Now, not everybody on the planet got the gospel on day one, but the planet got the gospel on day one. You know what that means? It just means that's what God's thinking about today. And it means that I have to ask the question, where on the list of my priorities is taking the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to every single person on planet Earth? Because I know it's top on the list of God's priorities. And it is the mission of the church. I like to think about it, an arrow that looks like this, and this was a little bit inspired by one of you. We stole this off your Instagram. Someone drew this in their Bible across their text, and we loved it so much that we just adopted it, because this is you, and this is me. The tip of the arrow is the authority of Jesus. That's what Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The arrow itself is the church. The tip of it is the authority, which is Jesus' name. So the tip of our arrow, that name and power of Jesus. Our arrow itself is the gospel. The, the, the shaft, I mean the point of the arrow is the gospel. The shaft of the arrow is the church, simply meaning none of us are on a solo mission. The, the feathers that are steering the arrow is the word of God. So we just don't have an arrow going out to wh wherever, doing whatever. But the word of God is guiding our flight as the people of God, carrying the gospel of God in Jesus' name. But our arrow is on fire. Our arrow is on fire by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so together, we make up a church which is... The plan A of Almighty God to finish the unfinished work of taking the finished work of Christ in the power of the Spirit to all the people on planet Earth. And I hope that you and I will walk away from these few moments inspired that we get to be a part of that. 
I was in a gathering a few weeks ago in California, sort of a consortium of organizations, and their focus, check this out, their focus are not the unreached people groups of the world. I think everybody here has probably heard of those. If, if not, that would be a people group, not a country with borders, but an ethnicity of people which could cross borders of a country or be multiple ethnicities, obviously, in a country. But an ethnicity of people with no access to church, no access to the scripture, no access to the gospel, where less than 1% of that people group know Jesus Christ and follow him. And there are thousands of unreached people groups. Thousands of them. But I was at a gathering that doesn't just focus on unreached people groups. It focuses on unengaged unreached people groups. You're like, man, you're starting to lose me on all this stuff. An unengaged unreached people group is a particular people who have no access to the gospel, no Bible, no way of getting to a church, nobody who's talking about Jesus, less than 1% of people in that whole people group, which may have 10 million people or 100 million people, know Jesus. But not only are they an unreached people group, they're an unengaged unreached people group, meaning no one at this moment even has it on the radar to reach that people group. And of those, there are somewhere near a thousand remaining. A thousand people groups who no one yet has stepped forward that we're aware of and said, we will figure out how to get the finished work of Christ to them. And I sat in this gathering, and I knew sitting there, this is what matters to God. And it's got to matter to us. Because the finished work of Christ gave birth to something called the church. And the church exists to finish the work of taking the finished work of Christ to every person on the planet. Let me put a face on it for you. The top 100 unreached people groups by population size, the top 100 out of 10,000, the top 100 totals 1.8 billion people. One that will maybe come as a little bit of a surprise to you, the Japanese people, unreached people group. You're like, no, they're not. It's Japan. <laughs> well, if you've been to Japan, like I have many times, I know someone's online coming to us from Tokyo right now. They can nod along. They'll say, yep. The gospel is alive there, but there are 122 million people in Japan, and less than 1% of them is a follower of Jesus. And hardly any of them speak English, by the way, so that's going to probably uh, rule a lot of us out, at least in terms of being the mouthpiece. The Sheikh people, just another face for us tonight, 233 million of them in Bangladesh and India mostly over 100 million in each place 233 million people no church that anybody can get to nobody preaching the gospel no scripture possibly in complete form in their language. Just darkness. Oh, they got a God. Just not the almighty God. That They have a religion, but they don't have the finished work yet. Oh, they're still on the treadmill hoping to work it out and hoping it all resolves somehow at the end, but they haven't heard about the it is finished yet, about a God who didn't invite them to figure out a way to get up, but a God who was willing to come all the way down to where they are. And Jesus said, this is our purpose. Hello? 
to take the finished work of Jesus to all the people on the planet. Now, Passion technically isn't a missions conference, and the end of this message isn't everyone needs to sign up to be a missionary. But the end of this message is, and the heart of Acts 2 is, and the heart of Jesus and the heart of the Holy Spirit is, everybody has to realize we are on mission. We have a reason for being alive in Christ, and it's to join Christ and to join the Spirit of God in taking the story of Jesus to everybody on the planet. I want you to see yourself tonight as an arrow. And I want to ask if you could put yourself as an arrow. And there's a collective we as the church. It's, again, not solo mission. But I wonder if you could see yourself tonight as a 22-year-old, as an arrow flaming by the Spirit of God in the hands of a merciful God. And you could say to him tonight, grip, draw, anchor, aim, release, and launch my life somewhere for your glory. See, we're not going to settle tonight where our arrows are going to go. Amen? If you, if you think you know where your arrow's going, all of us older people that are here, and eh. not going there. You're like, no, I absolutely know for sure what I'm going to do. I'm going to grad school after this. I'm getting the internship at so-and-so, and I'm getting the job in there, and then I'm going to transfer to there, and then I'm going to marry the so-and-so. I already know who she is, but she doesn't know it yet. <laughs> and um, highly unlikely that I had the gender going that way. Um, but, and then we're going to live in such and such, and blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. No, it's not going to work out that way. And you should... Hope to God it doesn't. Because whatever we're dreaming about for our lives almost always is way too small for what God's dreaming about. And you just never know what God has in mind. Christine was talking about who told you that. I was about 30 years old speaking at a youth conference in Texas, in the central Texas, teenagers. And it was and kind of indoor outdoor thing and after I spoke we were sitting at lunch me and some of the leaders who put it on at these picnic tables that's all I can remember about that, that part of it and we were sitting around this table about five of us and this guy says to me while we're sitting there he says so Louie what do you think you're going to do like in your life so I'm 30 and I just gave a talk at a youth thing so I'm thinking well you know kind of maybe what I'm doing right now seems like where God's leading me and so the question is, what are you going to do in your life? And I'm thinking about it. While I'm thinking about it, this other guy answers on my behalf. Have you ever had someone do that for you? Oh, well, I'll tell you, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, what? They weren't asking you. The guy says, well, I'll tell you one thing he's not going to do. And I was like, well, okay, hello. Thank you so much, Holy Spirit. I'm ready to hear this now. He said, he's not going to be a pastor of a local church. Guarantee you. Well, I didn't want to be a pastor of a local church, so I was fine with that. I said, okay. I thought you were going to say something I really like, maybe wanted to do. Okay, great, fine. And then the other guy says to him, well, why isn't he going to be the pastor of a local church? I feel like I could leave at this point, and they could just finish the conversation about God's purposes for my life. Why isn't he going to be the pastor of a local church? Because the way he preaches and teaches, he just comes in and blah, 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 and things blow up. And um, I didn't know how to steward my gift maybe as well as I do now when I was then, and, and I was younger and a little bit less mature and... And the guy said, yeah, that's probably true. People can't stand hearing that every week. And I don't know, I got some church members here. Maybe they, that guy wasn't too far off. But um, <laughs> I got up and walked away, and I just thought, okay, so I'm not going to be the pastor of a local church. Great. This was before passion. And then life unfolded, and 10 years of campus ministry at Baylor happened, and then 21 years of passion happened, and then a record label happened, and then getting the incredible opportunity to speak at events around the world happened, and I'm just thinking, okay, thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the game. We're at a local church. We're plugged into local church, but I'm not leading one, and it's because that guy said I wasn't ever going to lead one, and, and can I tell you this? When I was 45 years old, 
I started getting this sense in my heart that God wanted me to be the pastor of a local church. And I know this is going to be embarrassing for me to say out loud, but it took almost five years for me to agree with that. I'd kind of floated around friends. What do you think about maybe one day me being a pastor of a local church? I'm just get, trying to get feedback. Like, am I crazy or something's happening in my heart? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's me. And every time I would sense it, I would hear that guy at that table. I got nothing against that guy. I don't remember his name. don't remember who he was or where he came from. I don't even know if he's ever going to hear this. And he probably wouldn't remember it anyway. But I remember distinctly the day God said to me, I never told you you weren't going to be a local church pastor. That guy told you that. And I went, I'm going to be the pastor of a local church. 50 years old. Not as old as Moses, but, you know, not too far off. Not quite an Abraham's League, but you just check it out, look around. Not too many 50-year-old dudes planting churches for the first time. And here we are, nine years in, to the joy of my life. The honor of my life. So don't get too sure about what you're going to do. And whatever you do, don't let somebody else tell you what you're not going to do. Don't let anybody speak something to you that's different than what God is saying to you. Let your heart be tuned to God and his word. You have no idea where he's going to lead you. So we're not going to settle that tonight. We are not going to end this session and you're going to go, okay, I know where my arrow is going to go and where it is going to land. Thank you, God. You're not going to know that tonight at the end of this time. But here's one thing you can know tonight at the end of the time. You can know what your arrow is going to do when it lands wherever it lands. If it lands on Wall Street, or it lands in the middle of an unreached people group somewhere on the other side of the planet, you can say, I don't know where it's going to land. It might land in Major League Sports, like Tim Tebow, or it might land in a whole plethora of entertainment ideas like Sadie Robertson, or I might be a microbiologist like the person in the video. I don't know exactly where the arrow's going to land. If it's going to be in Cleveland or Columbus, Ohio, or whether it's going to be in California, or whether it's going to be in Cuba, I don't know where the arrow's going to land. But I'll tell you one thing I know. Wherever it lands, that arrow in the power of the Spirit of God is going to burn for the fame and the name and the renown of Jesus Christ. Wherever it lands. And I think when you and I settle that, we've answered both questions. Can I move past my past? Absolutely. Going to do that for sure. Why? The finished work of Christ. Are you kidding me? I'm cracking the rearview mirror. And do I know what my reason for being alive is? Absolutely. I want to make sure that the finished work of Jesus is shared in the power of the Holy Spirit to every person on this planet. And I'm going to do whatever I do in such a way that I can be a part of that because that's what God is doing on earth. And at the end of that mission being completed, that's when Jesus is going to come. Because Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached to every nation, meaning people group, and then the end will come. So if you're of that mindset of, Jesus, we just need you to come now, then you have not checked in with the 1.8 billion people in the top 
hundred unreached people groups who if he comes now will have no shot at the finished work of Jesus. So our prayer isn't come get us out of this. Our prayer is please don't come today. Yeah, things are going crazy, but please don't come today. Please extend mercy one more day because we want to get busy as your people to finish the job that you gave us to do and the power of the Spirit that came to set us ablaze to do just that. So how's it going to happen that you get your arrow in the hands of a merciful God tonight? It's going to happen with these questions, and I'll close with these. Number one, do you trust his hands? Because trust is a big deal. And that all goes back to the finished work of Christ. Because the hands that draw the bow are scarred by the nails that bought your freedom. So that's a bow you can put your arrow in. But I don't know where he's going to shoot me. Who cares? These hands, their scars bought my freedom. And I am alive because of this archer named Jesus. So, do you trust him? Plan unseen. Do you trust him? Enough to say to him, I don't know if it's going to be in entertainment or in education or as a, a mom or as a banker or a broker or a baker or an athlete or an artist or somebody in tech or somebody in finance. See, all that, can I just tell you, none of that really matters. You're like, what do you mean it doesn't matter? Well, of course it matters because God wired you up and uniquely gifted you to be great at something. So, yes, it matters. But life's not about what you do. Life is about why you do what you do. It's about whether or not there's going to be a John 3.16 moment for somebody. Because you're a great mom on the street. Or a different guy in finance or a different girl in government. That's what life is about. So the question is, do you trust his hands? The second question is, do you believe that the purpose is grand? In other words, do you believe that the whole world hearing about Jesus is better than your plan? Because if you do, it's going to be easy for you to say, put my arrow in the bow and light it on fire by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't miss that tonight, by the way. I showed up at, on tour where our passion band guys were touring a couple years ago, and it was the last night of the tour, and I came in just for the last night. And I got inspired by this Crowder tour a few years earlier where they did a, a super great cookout every night around their tour bus on this big tour they were on. And I was inspired by that, and I thought, I'm going to come in the last night, and we're going to have a cookout. So we got the coals and the little grill. The grill is about this big. You've seen it. It's on your patio. And we put the coals in there. The fire got hot, burned down. We put the top on it. And then we put as many fillets as you can put on that size grill, uh, which was about 20. And in about 18 minutes, the whole fire had gone out. The temperature of the meat had overwhelmed the little teeny tiny coals in the grill. And we were like, uh-oh. Three hours later, because <laughs> I'm determined about my epic ideas. Three hours later, someone took a bite of a very rare steak. <laughs> but we had a great time. And you know, I think a lot of us are going back to our campus, and that is the picture, honestly. It's like a dinky little grill with no fire. 
And God does want to add to our number every single day people who are being saved. He does want to revolutionize your life from a hideout to being outspoken for the gospel. He wants to change you from a little inclusive group of believers to an outwardly reaching, God wonder declaring group of believers so that everybody can hear the wonders of God in their own native tongue. The athletes can, and the real smart people can, and the sorority people can, and the people who are kind of off doing their own thing can. Everybody gets it in their own language. Why? Because there was enough fire on our lives by the Holy Spirit indwelling and filling our lives that we actually could, in fact, invite the neighborhood and see God do a miracle. And some of you are trying to cook 20 steaks on a, on a grill that's too small. And you need to ask the Holy Spirit to invade your life with fire. So do you trust his hands? Do you, I'm asking you, do you believe that the purpose is grand? And then I'll close. I'm done and past my time. The last question. Do you believe the cost is worth it? Everybody wants to talk about Acts 2. The Holy Spirit came. Tongues of fire. But Pentecost ends with the word cost. And the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he's going to lead us to great sacrifice. Spoiler alert. You ready? Book of Acts. Don't you love it? Don't you love the book of Acts? Power of God, the arrival of the Spirit, the mission of the church, the expansion of the gospel. Don't you love it? Spoiler alert. Everybody dies. Peter dies. Stephen dies. Paul dies. All the disciples die. They all give it all because Pentecost started the journey to the greatest cost because penetrating the darkness, kicking open the doors of hell and freeing captives into the light of the finished work of Jesus is not a walk in the park. It is a war in the spirit. And God is saying, are you willing to come? Are you willing to count the cost? Are you willing to pay a price? so that all the peoples on the earth can hear about the finished work of Jesus.